we are still in a series of the study of the book of Proverbs. And today we're in Proverbs 20. The Lord is faithful. He's helped us this far. I'm so grateful that I get to study Proverbs with you before the year is over. I am thankful for that. Um, so it's Proverbs chapter 20, obviously. And today we are going to look at a number of things. We're going to look at habits. We're going to look at our weights. When I say weights, I'm not talking whether you are 2 kg or 20 kg. I'm talking of our measuring scales. And then we will look at what represents wickedness. We're going to look at all of this. We have 30 verses. So I need to be a, a bit fast so that we'll be done. I appreciate that today is Sunday and some of us need to get ready to go to church. So, Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1. I have both the Amplified Version and the Message Version open. And I will go back and forth depending on what, on what best explains what. Verse 1 says, Wine makes you mean. Beer makes you quarrelsome. A staggering drunk is not much fun. Wine makes you, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a riotous brawler. And whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. You know, a lot of us spend so much time on the, on the conversation of whether it's okay to drink wine or it's not okay. Whether alcohol is a sin or alcohol is not a sin. And I keep saying to people, I'm not the legislator of that. Even if we told you it's, it's a sin anyway, you will still go and drink it, so why bother? But here's the thing. It is not the drink that is the problem. It is what the drink can make you do. Contrary to what, or maybe you don't know this, let me highlight it. In Jewish culture, to drink wine or alcoholic drink isn't a sin, especially in the Old Testament. But it is forbidden for a man to be intoxicated by the drink that he takes. What it meant was that you are supposed to be able to measure your equilibrium when it comes to drinking. And so it was not right for people to drink and be um, intoxicated. The thing about drink is not whether it is, um, it is a sin or not for most people. It is the things that get to happen in the era of drinking. That's what it is. Many years ago, I suffered from ulcer. And when I say so ulcer, I mean stomach ulcer, and it was bad. It was really bad. And sometimes it would be a, an, a monthly occurrence. Eventually, I found out that unforgiveness was a trigger for it. But before we get to that unforgiveness matter, and we won't get to it today, is that someone suggested that when that begins to happen to me, I should take a little red wine. The person said a little red wine, no. That when you take a little red wine, that it helps. So I told my husband, first actually I remember, if I remember, had suggested a particular brand so i called my husband and i said boy they said wine is will help ease this thing so i don't get to go to the hospital every time could you help me find this particular wine so mcmordy looked number one we didn't have so much money so he had to look for the money first then he now had to look for the wine considering that it was something we did eventually he found it and he brought it home <laughs> and truly, the next time I had that, I drank. Shabita told me a little, I drank a little. Two things happened. It was sweet wine. And I like sweet things. The second thing was that it actually did ease that pain. So that started to make it into my grocery release every month. So yes, when I have the also pain, I would take it. But then after a while, I realized that 
I would just have a craving for the sweet taste of that wine. So now I didn't have ulcer pain. I would go take a sip. And I kept at it for a while. One day I woke up and I realized that I had become a slave to that drink. Literally. It wasn't that I binged on it every day. I don't recall that I drank it and I became intoxicated and stuff like that. But just the mere fact that it was supposed to be medicine, remember? It was supposed to be prescribed. And I was supposed to take it only when I was in pain. And now even when I wasn't in pain, I would go and take it. Opened my eyes to the fact that wine is a wicked master. And that was how. Number one, I had to beg my husband to tell my husband actually to say this thing. I have found out that I have become slave to it. And that was how God helped me and I stopped. My point is not so that you will laugh at me. Because some of you are still deeply slaves to wine anyway. But the point is that strong drink has a character and a spirit on its own. But I'm not trying to get you to stop. I'm just trying to tell you what tends to happen. So it has the capacity to enslave. That's why the Bible talks about it. Verse number two, I spent too much time on verse one, but I thought you needed to know that. The terror of a king is like the roaring of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger forfeits his own life. If a mere human king when he's, in, when he's angry, can be as the roaring of a lion and one can lose his life if he provokes him to anger. Have you thought about your own king? And it is, it is instructive that this verse is coming right after the verse on strong on, on drink. If you, provoke, if you, some, if you are at, at a risk for your life, when you provoke a human king, think about when you provoke the king of kings. I'll just leave that for you to be chewing on, really quickly go on. Verse 3 says, it is an honor for a man to keep away from strife by handling situations with thoughtful insight. But any fool will start a quarrel without regard for the consequences. It is an honor for a man to keep away from strife. Sometimes we actually think that it is honor that makes us want to fight things out. The Bible says it is greater honor to just keep away from, from strifing. That's what the Bible says. So when you can keep away from strife, you are honorable because any fool can start a quarrel. So there are many fools who started a quarrel because they are foolish, not because they are honorable men. But they hide under the guise of, I'm, I'm angry because somebody is being oppressed. Meanwhile, what they started to do by their, by their quarrel does not align with fighting for the oppressed. Nowhere is it okay to go personal in an establishment, in, 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 an, in a structured um, um, environment or whatever, simply because you are fighting injustice. Somebody will come and say, oh, for instance, I'm just saying that uh, there's traffic in Lagos and somebody, a believer will open their mouth and curse the governor because there's traffic in Lagos. The governor is not the system. He might be the steward of the state, but he's not the system. So to leave the fact that some of us are driving like whatever, I know the roads are not enough, I'm not holding forth for government. But to release a curse on somebody's husband and children, simply because the government that is all of us isn't doing well, is to strive foolishly. Let's go on. I'm just saying. The lazy man does not plow when the winter, is, the winter planting season arrives. So he begs at the next harvest and has nothing to reap. Planting season is planting season. If you sleep through the planting season, hiding under your duvet, the Bible says in the time of harvest, you will have nothing to reap, so you would beg. In the word, it is said like this, make hay when the sun shines. 
it will never be convenient to do the things that will make for your future. It is never convenient, but you need to get up and do it. A plan in the heart of a man is like water in a deep well, but a man of understanding draws it out. It's saying that men of understanding can get wise men to divulge wisdom to them. Men who have understanding can get wise men to divulge wisdom to them, to share wisdom with them, to share wisdom with them. There is something called the power of questioning that if you have it, you ultimately be wise because you will ask the right questions which will elicit the right answers. Verse 6, many a man proclaims his own loyalty and goodness, <laughs> but who can find a faithful and trustworthy man? This version doesn't say it properly. Let me see whether the message, it says lots of people claim to be loyal and faithful, but where on earth can you find one? The idea isn't that there are no people who are faithful sometimes. The idea is that we shouldn't boast of our faithfulness. Because that will be the fox of the Pharisee. Remember when they say, he said, thank God I'm not like this useless sinner standing here praying. The Bible says, even when you think you are righteous, humility is the standard. You are not the one that is supposed to blow your trumpet and say, I'm a righteous man. I'm an honorable man. It's not you that should write your name and put honorable in front of your name. Let others do it for you. The righteous man who walks in integrity lives in accord with his godly beliefs. beliefs. How blessed and spiritually secure are his children after him who have his example to follow. Another reason as a parent why you should live well, live uprightly, do righteousness, is because then you have your children have a model and an example to follow. The lives that we live are not specifically only for us. People are watching us and people are counting on us to live good lives off of our example. And the last time I checked, what we do speaks louder than what we say. So it's not by preaching to your children, do not do. It's what are you doing? Do you preach one thing and do another? That's the question you need to ask and answer. A descending king who sits on the throne of judgment sifts all evil like chaff with his eyes and cannot be easily fooled. Discernment is critical. We've, we heard it even beginning from chapter 1 of the book of Proverbs. Verse 10, 9, who can say, I have cleansed my heart and I am pure from my sin? Who? Consistently, you ought to come and say, Lord, I crave your mercy. There is nothing to, okay, so you were tempted yesterday, you did not sin. So you boast today. Your boast is sin. Do you see it? Can you see the picture now? Deferring weights, one for buying and one for another for selling and deferring measures. Both of them are detestable and offensive to the Lord. We talked about our measuring olodos and scales and weights last, um, I think last week. So I won't dwell on it. But it also means that if you have people on your team and you don't treat them fairly, the Bible says it is offensive to the Lord. It is offensive to the Lord. Even a boy is known and distinguished by his arts. Whether his content is pure and right. So the Bible is saying it's not by what you say you do. What you should, it is by, it is by what you actually do. It says that we are known, that even a child is known by his actions, not by the things that he promises. My brothers and my sisters, do your, our promises align with our, our, the words we speak? The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made both of them. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made both of them. Ears that hear and eyes that see, they are our basic equipment from God. 
What do you do with your eyes and your ears? It is funny or it is instructive that the kind of ear and the kind of eye is qualified. It therefore means that there are eyes that don't see and there are ears that do not hear. So this is a good place for you to pray and say, Father, that my ears may hear and my eyes may see. That my ears may hear and that my eyes may see. In the name of Jesus. Verse 13. Do not love excessive sleep or you will become poor. Open your eyes so that you can do your work and you will be satisfied with bread. If you sleep too much, they say poverty is knocking at the door. I've told us, go and buy the book Theology of Work. It will tell you that work is the channel through which God commits wealth to his children. You don't just wake up and wealth falls on you. You work hard for wealth to come. It says if you sleep excessively, then the natural consequence is not a curse. It's not the witches in your village that will do you. If you sleep too much, poverty will reach your house. Open your eyes. That is, wake up so you can walk and you will be satisfied with the bread. May the Lord grant us grace in Jesus' name. Verse 14, it is almost worthless. It is almost worthless, says the buyer, as he negotiates the price. But when he goes his way, then he boasts about his bargain. Do you see this? This is not to say that negotiations are bad. But this is to say, this is to say, pay attention to me. This is to say that you should watch out. That people will say to you, ah, ah, it's too expensive. They are trying to get one on you. What you should do with your pricing is to be fair. God does not frown at a profit. What it frowns, frowns at is that it's at an unrighteous profit when the profit is excessive. So as long as you're within what in your mind is righteous profit, then it is okay to say no to your negotiator. Did you get that? There is gold and an abundance of pearls, but the leaves of knowledge are a vessel of preciousness, the most precious of all. It says the leaves of knowledge, what you know and you speak, surpasses gold and abundance, which is why you must be teachable because it is a teaching, um, it is a teaching um, heart that, um, what's the word? It is a teaching, a teachable life rather, that births wisdom. Since we're here, I want to say something to you that I said to my mentees last week um, on Saturday or you know, Friday when we were closing mentorship for the year. We said, I said to them that wisdom grows in three kinds of communities. Number one, learning communities. You must learn if you want to grow. Number two, humble communities. You must be humble if you want to grow. And number three, challenging communities. You must face challenges head on if you want to grow in wisdom. That's just um, a bonus. Let me go on. Verse 16. The judge tells the creditor, take the clothes of who is shorty for a stranger and hold him in pledge when he guarantees a loan for foreigners. The Bible speaks against usury. So if you don't have an established um, borrowing company when i say established registered and licensed you are not supposed to give money with interest yes but if you go somewhere even if it is run by church but and it is established and you take a loan or you stand shorty for someone the bible says they can take your cloth just in case the person defaults this just to, again to buttress that you can be nice to people but know that if the if there is a fallout or a consequence and it will require you giving up something complete your being nice give it to them do not go to court food gained by deceit is sweet to a man but afterwards his mouth will be filled with gravel 
food. The, you know, in the King James, it says the bread of deceit. The bread of deceit. When you do magu magu and you deceive people to take stuff from them. When you get people into schemes that you know will, bu will bust in a minute. But because you want to make a quick buck. The Bible says that the bread of deceit is sweet. Whatever you get and you get by deception. The Bible says it will be sweet for a while. But a day is going to come that it will look like you are chewing on gravel. Just the, 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 the picture alone makes my skin crawl. Imagine taking sand and putting your mouth and trying to chew. They said that's what happens to a man who decided to get rich by deceitful means. May the Lord give us wisdom in the name of Jesus. Plans are established by counsel. So make war only with wise guardians. If you must go to war, if you want to grow in your 2021, for instance, seek out wise counsel. Again, be teachable and be open to correction or receive correction. Remember what we said yesterday. Listen, receive, accept. Do you remember yesterday? Listen, receive, accept. Listen, receive, accept. Listen, receive, accept. Will soon be done. I won't finish this chapter. You may have to read it yourself. Verse 20 says, whoever causes his father or his mother, his lamp of life will be extinguished in the time of darkness. Jesus. Do I even need to elaborate? May you be wise in Jesus' name. And the reality is very, only children of perdition curse their fathers. But there are attitudes that are curses to our parents. Be careful. Let's go on. And inheritance hastily gained by greedy or just means at the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Brothers and sisters, that your father will leave you something. You begin to fight and begin to pay people to change will back and forth. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Do not say, verse 22, I will repay evil. Wait, and he would rescue and save you. Sometimes, you know, there was a year that a group of people ups, up, offended me. And I was plotting my revenge. I was so hurt that I was, I spent a month or more just like plotting my revenge. And I kept plotting it and I kept plotting it. I wanted to exact my, my pound of flesh. One day God came to me and he said, be to me. I said, sir. He said, do you honestly think that you can reward them or you can get revenge the way I can get revenge on your behalf? I thought about it and I realized that the vengeance of the Lord is unparalleled. He said to me, he said, let them go. I will deal with them by myself and it is time. My brothers and sisters, do not say I will repay if you wait because God by himself will come. He will rescue and he will save you and he will come with his just recompense. That's what the Bible says. We've talked about detestable um, uh, deferring weights. It's being repeated in verse 23 again. It says they are not good. Detestable and they are deferring weights are detestable and offensive, offensive to God. Fraudulent cases are not good. Stop. Stop. You buy the knockoff, you pass it off like it's the real deal because you want to make money. Be careful. Your sins will find you out one day soon. Stop. It's not business sense. It is wickedness. Business ought to be um, executed or transacted in righteousness. May the Lord give you understanding in Jesus' name. Verse 25, it is a trap for a man to speak a vow of consecration and say rashly, it is holy. And not until afterward consider whether he can fulfill it. A wise king sifts out the wicked from among the good and drives the threshing wheel over them to separate the path from the wheel. 
a day is going to come and you can't hide your true color. They will sift you out. Why don't you just be the same person at home, at work, in church, wherever you go, and save yourself the stress of having to readjust. May the Lord help us. In the name of Jesus, verse 27, I know I'm rushing. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. I like the Amplified. It says the spirit, that is the conscience of man, is the lamp of the Lord. You remember the scripture that says if your conscience, if your conscience does not um, condemn you, you are not condemned. This is why it can say so. It says the spirit of or the conscience conscience of man is the lamp of the Lord. The Lord put conscience in you. Part of eternity that God put in our hearts, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 through to 12, is also a conscience. Your conscience is God's lamp implanted in you so that you can already tell when something is bad. How do I know? Look at a three-month-old baby or a six-month-old baby who bites at its mother's breast. What does it do? It usually will look at the mother because that child instinctively knows that what it had done is wrong. Your conscience is the light of the Lamb of God in you. It searches and examines your innermost parts. So here is the thing. If you wanted to do something and you thought perhaps this thing is not good, I promise you it is not good. Stop. Another way that the conscience works is you want to do something. If you begin to hide it from the people who you know will tell you truth around you, you ought to stop because even without opening the Bible, the lamp of God on the inside of you just made you see that you are going to be breaking or contravening something that God has talk, asked us not to do. Loyalty and mercy. Truth and faithfulness, they protect the king. Loyalty and mercy. Are you loyal to your king? Are you merciful? Are you loyalty? Are you, merc are you loyal? Are you merciful? Truth and faithfulness. Are you truthful? Are you faithful? These are the protection of a king. Because a king is only as powerful as his subjects. And these are loyal, merciful, faithful and truthful subjects. He upholds his throne by loving kindness. Even when we talk to, about, talk to God, or we talk about God as our king, he expects loyalty, mercy, truth, and faithfulness from us. Because these are part of his character. God is loyal, God is merciful, God is truthful. And if our God is truth, and God is faithful. Think about it. The glory of a young man is his strength, physical. And the honor of the aged man is his gray hair, representing wisdom and experience. May you not be an aged man or woman who they count as not wise. May that not be your portion. What this proverb is saying is that, Yes, we can understand youthful or excuse youthful exuberance in young people. But the older you get, what we expect from you is wisdom. Because your experience is bound to make you wise. If you listen, if you accept, and if you receive. May the Lord grant us wisdom in Jesus' name. Finally, blows that wound cleanse away evil and strokes each to the innermost parts. Let me read that in the message version. It says, a good trashing purges evil. Punishment goes deep within us. That's why sometimes discipline is how God shows us that he's our father. He will give good trashing. The Bible says it will purge evil quick, quick. It says punishment goes deep within us. Have you ever seen a child where the mother says, do not touch that thing, it is hot. Just because it's yellow and bright, the child wants to touch it at all costs. If the mother would just let the child put his hand over that flame and feel the heat for a second, when that child sees the color yellow for a long time, the child will not go near it. 
I told us that there is a way you can overshield your child and destroy them in the process. Discipline is good. It says, blows that wound, they purge evil. May the Lord grant us wisdom. If you've been on this prayer call this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, today is a really good day to do that. How about you pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. The rest of you pray. What are you asking God to do for you this morning? Concerning what we have heard, not the prayer for another car. Concerning what we have heard this morning, what do you think you should be asking the Lord to do? There are many things. May the Lord grant you grace to pray the right prayer. If you're on this prayer call and you have not given your life to Jesus, could you please pray this money with me? And you want to give your life to Jesus. Pray with me this morning. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Is there anyone praying? If you're praying that, please type it. I'd wait for a couple of minutes to see. If you want to give your life to Jesus, if you've never done that before, or you did it many years and then life happened and you stopped following him, today is a good day to come back. Will you cross that line of faith this morning and say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Is there anyone praying with me this morning to say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Is there anyone this morning? Please pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Is there anyone? Pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Is there anyone this morning who wants to? Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Pray that with me this morning. For the rest of us, may the Lord grant us wisdom. The reality is now we know, we've heard. May this not stand against us in the day of judgment. May the Lord teach, open my eyes, not you. Open my eyes to see where I need to make adjustment. And may I be bold enough to make that adjustment. In the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining the prayer call this morning. I'll see you tomorrow morning. If Jesus tarries, may the Lord bless and keep you. Oh, I was thinking. No, I'm not thinking. It's all good. God bless you and have a fantastic week ahead of you. Thank you to everyone who gave to us the um, uh, Project 210. We did that yesterday. Of course, what we took did not scratch the surface of where we went, but we were grateful to God that we were able to do the little that we could. We trust God to meet all those people with his loving kindness and provide for them in the name of Jesus. That's my prayer for that neighborhood in the Jokonde area of, Lake of, um, of, of Lagos Island was where we retreated yesterday. Thank you so much for your seeds. I declare that your harvest will come and it will be the right harvest in the name of Jesus. Thank you very much. God bless and keep you. I'll see you tomorrow morning if Jesus tarries. Bye-bye.